Greetings! I am Herbert Herbert and today I'm going to build this Panzer IV, which is of course the 172nd scale model from Zvezda. According to my notes, this is actually the first Zvezda kit I've built in this scale, though I have shown at least one other, the T-35, before this. There should be a card around here somewhere with a link to that video if you're interested. This kit, according to Scalemates, is a 2018 release, so at the time of recording this was a pretty recent release. Of course I didn't realise that when I bought it, Impulse buying Herbert just liked the picture. The back of the box shows a handful of images of the built but unpainted model, much like their 15mm scale boxes. It also tells us that there are 147 parts and that the model is 10cm long, which is roughly 4 inches in freedom units. Not much else here, but what more do you really need? Inside the box we find a bag full of plastic, 7 sprues in total, 2 for most of the tank's parts and 4 for all of the road wheels, and this black sprue for tracks. At first I thought these were rubber band tracks, fortunately they aren't. The plastic in this kit is pretty nice, it's all quite neat and tidy, the moulding is crisp and I couldn't find any defects. There are mould lines of course, which I wouldn't really consider a defect, they're fairly normal, and on this kit they're fairly minor. It should be quite easy to get these parts cleaned up. The detail is pretty decent. You wouldn't call it super detailed by any stretch, but by no means is it bad. All of the important bits and pieces are there. In some of the shots here you can see that some of the sprues do have a little bit of a curve to them. I'm not really sure why, but it doesn't seem to have negatively affected any of the parts. It looks like everything should go together with a minimum of fuss, though some parts, like the brackets for the shirts and do look a little bit fiddly. The tracks look pretty good and are nicely detailed. These are fairly firm, but they're also flexible, which is a style of tracks that I've not encountered before, or at least I don't think I have. Hopefully they go on without breaking or otherwise being annoying. This small set of decals is also included. There are two sets of numbers, one of which has crosses connected to it. I would have liked if there were a few more decals here, but this should be enough. And it's not like German decals are hard to come by if these aren't enough. The instructions are quite large, and I found them a bit difficult to get into frame. They're decent enough though. I didn't have any issues with understanding and following them. If for some reason you don't want to use the paper instructions, or if you've lost them, they are also available online as a PDF, and I will link that in the description. There's also this sheet of paper with two painting and marking guides. These are of course quite simple, but work as a nice basic starting point. I feel like I say that a lot, but it's true and there isn't really much else to say about them. That's not really what we're here for anyway. We're here to see bits of plastic glued to other bits of plastic, the first of which is the bits of plastic that make up the stowage bin for the rear of the turret. An odd place to start, but why not? Go with me on this adventure. The lid part slides right into the body, and it's very simple. I set that aside and it's time for another sub-assembly, the commander's cupola. You glue one half to the other and then you end up with this vaguely hamburgery looking commander's cupola. It might seem like a silly idea to start with the shirts and now, considering the rest of the tank hasn't even been started, but the instructions want it built now, and I'm scared they'll do something awful if I don't. This is a relatively simple matter of gluing the support bracket on the inside of each curved section of turret shirts, and of which there are two. Then it's time to build the turret. The upper and lower halves of the turret go together quite easily. The only place you really have to watch for gaps is at the front where the lower part angles upward. That's the only place they're really going to be visible anyway, and a little bit of pressure will take care of it. The side doors go on pretty easy, as you can see. Just make sure that you're putting the right door on the right side. And by right, I mean correct. Which would also mean right as in the opposite of left, because the left door goes on the left side. Who would have thought? The instructions will tell you which is which. Also there are two bumps, one on each door at the bottom and one bump at the top of the forward door. This is followed by these pieces with the little handles that go above the doors. I nudge them with my knife, which is pretty simple. I guess these are to make entering and exiting the turret a bit easier. Then comes this ring thing which glues into the recess around where the commander's cupola will go. 
This probably has a more technical name, but we're going to call it… Reginald. Reginald is pretty simple to get into place, though do be sure you've got it around the right way. Now it's time to work on the front of the turret. Onto the front wall of the turret I add this inner mantlet bit, whatever you might call it. You'll be able to make it so that this gun can elevate and depress. You just need to be a bit careful with the glue, and glue in this inner backing part. As long as the glue doesn't get into the little axily bits from the front wall, it'll move. I then glue on the outer mantlet part. Again, if you're careful with the glue and don't get it everywhere, the parts will remain movable. That's not really what I want, but it is nice to be able to adjust the part when checking it against the rest of the turret. I'm doing this so that I can see what the gun elevation will be like before gluing it solidly in place. Obviously you wouldn't glue it into place if you wanted gun elevation, but I don't. I prefer it to stay where it is. I put that aside, and then glue the commander's cupola into place. There isn't really much to this. There is a bit of keying so it only goes on one way, with the hatch's hinge on the turret's left side. I then glue the stowage bin on. This is made nice and easy by the bar that protrudes from the rear of the turret, which slots into the gap in the bottom of the box. I think this is a nice piece of design. I make sure that it's nice and level, and then add a bit of glue to where the mounting bars contact the turret body. Then we have a nice big turret rear stowage bin, ready to be filled with sauerkraut or whatever Germans put in their stowage. Next I glue the turret front into place. This pretty much just drops right into the big hole at the front of the turret. A little pressure and it's on, and it looks quite nice. Then it's time for the turret's shirtson. This is simple in concept. The reality was that it's kind of fiddly. I glue the two rear curved sections into place. Then I spent more time than this video would imply futzing about with them and getting them aligned with each other and the rest of the turret. I think I did a reasonable job here, though looking at the video now it does seem to be a bit wonky. I do like that the instructions had the sections of shirts and as sub-assemblies, which gave the parts time to bond while we worked on the rest of the turret. Moving along, I glue the support brackets to the inside of the forward shirts and parts. These took a fair bit of fiddling, and I held the parts up near the turret to see if it looks like everything is going to line up. I leave these to bond for a bit so they don't just come apart when I try to put them on, but I don't just sit there waiting for the glue to dry. There's other things that can be done, like cleaning up and drilling out the main gun. I'll get around to installing that a bit later. Now it's time to attach the rest of the turret shirts and this video is obviously edited down so that it doesn't take six weeks, but this did take quite a bit of fiddling and nudging, which is why the focus and framing is a bit bad here. I kind of forgot about the camera. I use the door part to gauge if I have the forward part close to the correct position, and then I glue that door part into place. Initially it doesn't fit so I manipulate the front part a bit more and eventually I get something I'm satisfied with. It's probably not quite perfect, but it's on and it looks okay. The assembly for the left side of the turret is pretty much the same. I was a little bit uncertain about the angle of the door parts. It looks like it might be a little bit sharp, but it's probably fine. It looks decent enough anyway, so I move on. And I glue the coaxial machine gun into place, which is a tiny part and required the use of tweezers. And then my knife to nudge it into the final position. I follow that with the main gun. It would be kind of silly to leave that off. The gun has a D-shaped keying, which allows it to only be installed one way. There's a little bit of play in the fit, so I nudge it until it's as straight as I can get it, both vertically and horizontally, and it ends up looking very gun, though maybe a little depressed. I normally elevate my guns just a little bit more. Now let's move on to the hull. Putting the lower hull together is a simple affair. The floor and side parts are keyed so it should be obvious when the parts are in the correct position. A little gap reducing pressure was needed here, but nothing too severe. Once they're all together, I glue the whole rear on. Again, this has some keying, so it's very easy to get the correct positioning. I mean, as long as you don't do something wild like glue it on sideways or something, but you wouldn't do that, would you? You would. Madness. Next comes the upper part of the lower hull. Once more, keying makes this very easy to get into place. Very hull. That can then be set aside because now is a really good time to work on wheels. Yep, we're making that joke again. 
I didn't last week, did you notice? Anyway, we turned this pile of wheels into road wheels, which is a simple process of gluing them all together. Both halves of the wheel are different, but still quite similar looking. You can see that I had the two kinds of wheels separated into different piles to make this easier. Instead of installing those wheels, because the suspension parts aren't in place yet, I add the shackly brackety parts to the front of the hull. There are some large rectangular recesses for these to mount into. These parts are different for either side, so do be sure to use the correct ones. I used my knife to nudge them into position as best I could. There is still a slight gap around them, but they look reasonable enough. Next, why not glue the two halves of the drive sprockets together? That ought to be a laugh. These are shaped such that they will lock together. Not in one specific position, but they should sit such that the teeth are all lined up nicely and will mesh with the tracks. I follow those with the idler wheels. The inner wheel mounts to the axley part, which is simple enough, and then the other wheel goes on. There's keying here so that the spokes line up nice and neatly. Really good wheels. Speaking of wheels, in order to attach the road wheels we're going to need to add the suspension gear, so I do that next. These parts are different for either side of the hull, though they do look very similar to each other. I clip out the parts for one side, install them, and then do the other side. That way I can avoid mixing up the parts and being all confused and having my brain explode, because apparently that's what happens when you get confused. The suspension parts are pretty easy to get into place. There are nice big rectangular recesses for them to mount into, though there is a little bit of play, so do be careful that they're as straight as you can get them. I follow this with return rollers. These are easy to place. They go nicely into the mounting holes along the top of the hull. You should be careful to get these as straight and neat as you can as well. Instead of installing those road wheels, I add some stuff to the hull rear. Who doesn't like hull rear stuff? Like these… mounts? I don't know if they have a proper name. Whatever they are, these will hold the idler wheels. It's probably a good idea to add these and let the glue set up before trying to install the idler wheels. Next comes a box of some sort. Whatever this is, it goes into place pretty easily, and there's a couple of rectangular bars for it to mount onto. After that comes this bit of towing hitch. Like a lot of the other small bits, this is pretty fiddly, but not too bad. The whole rear isn't complete yet, but let's just go and put the drive sprockets on anyway. The axle on the inside of the drive sprocket easily goes into the hole in the final drives. There's no keying for this, and it shouldn't really matter how the teeth on the sprocket are oriented. They're the only toothy wheel, and you should be able to work the tracks around it. Then come the road wheels, because why not? These are unsurprisingly easy to install. The fit is a bit loose though, so you'll have to nudge them around a bit to try and get them lined up nice and straight. It's pretty easy to do anyway, as is the installation of the idler wheels. These of course do have the axley bit mounted onto them, and it fits nicely into the hole created by the little doohickey we glued on earlier. It did take a little bit of nudging to get the part to sit straight, but it could be worse. While the glue on the running gear sets, I add some details to the track guard part. Starting with this two-part whatever it's called, it's a track joining tool of some sort, I just don't know the name. Surprising? Not even a little. This bit is pretty fiddly to put together, and only a little bit less fiddly to get into place. It has been a while since I actually did this build, but I do remember this being a bit annoying. Ah oh, well, bound to happen every now and then. Next, the fire extinguisher goes right next to that track whatever thing. Tweezers were quite helpful here. Then comes a set of wire cutters. You never know when you're going to want to cut some wires. Just like you never know when you might want to axe a question. So I install an axe here on the front right fender. Then this bar goes on the left rear like so. And then another different bar with a loop in one end goes on the right rear. Just as easy as the other bar. Ordinarily I think it's a better idea to add small details to a piece like this while it's on the tank, so that I'm less likely to cause damage to those parts when adding the larger assembly to the tank, but in this case, the extra bits are all pretty flat and there shouldn't really be an issue. Moving on, it's time to install the tracks. I started by gluing the tracks to the bottom of the road wheels. 
which at the time seemed like a sensible idea, and it's not a bad idea, though I think it might have been a bit smarter to start at the drive sprockets, just to avoid any trouble getting the teeth meshed with the tracks. Oh well, maybe I'll do that next time. I bend the tracks up and around the drive sprocket and it fortunately links into the teeth pretty well. These tracks do bend quite easily, though I did still manage to break it in one spot. Fortunately I was able to press the ends back together so it wasn't a problem, and I was a bit more careful going forward. I bend the other end up around the idler wheel and then join the two ends. The good thing about this is it bonds with regular plastic cement, which is an issue with rubber band tracks. You need to use super glue with those. Unfortunately the result isn't totally perfect, especially on the tank's left. The idler wheel is at a bit of an unfortunate angle, and the pressure from the tracks wasn't especially helpful here. Maybe I should have slowed down and been a bit more careful here. I guess the way to deal with this is just to avoid looking at it from the rear. They do look okay from the side. Let's not let that stop us from moving on. Next I install that fender part onto which I've installed those details earlier. This is pretty simple, though a bit of pressure was required to eliminate the gaps as much as possible. I think it's most important to eliminate the gaps at the front where they'll be the most visible. Next we have the upper front plate. This is the back side, through which we will slot the machine gun part. There's keying here, though I don't think it's really needed. It's still helpful though, I suppose. I make sure the gun part doesn't protrude back past the end of the plate part, and it can be glued into place. There's some very helpful keying here to make sure you get the part centered. It would be kind of fiddly to do without this keying. Then there's a couple of, well I guess you'd call them hull sides? Hull walls? Whatever. These parts are shaped such that you should easily be able to tell when they're not lined up correctly, and then change it so that they are lined up correctly. I do my best to eliminate the gaps here, and it ended up looking pretty decent. Then come the spare road wheels in their handy dandy little rack. Some might say that it's a nice rack. Some might say that it's not a rack. Boobs. Then why not attach the upper hull to the lower hull? There are some bits of keying to guide it and you just have to add pressure to the right places to try and minimise any gaps. Pay attention to the front and rear of the hull, because those are the places where the gaps are likely to be more visible. I then install this panel thing to the side of the engine deck on the right side. It did need to be nudged into place and the fit isn't perfect, but it does the trick. Onto that I glue a shovel. This is of course very simple, and the crew can now dig holes, for fun and business. And by business, I mean poopin'. Following that, I install this radio antenna holdy tray thing. Not the hardest little detail to get into place, but still a little bit fiddly because of the slightly tight space towards the bottom of it. Tweezers are helpful. Next comes the jack. A jack is probably quite a handy tool for a tank to have. Never know when you're going to need to do some jackin'. Then comes this brackety thing. I don't know what it is. It's not a shirts and support. Whatever it is, it goes here just in front of the upper frontal plate and across the lower axe handle. Spare track links are next, nothing especially tricky about these, and you could leave them off if you would prefer that. To assist the crew with seeing at night, I place the headlamp here at the front left of the tank. I try to get it facing forwards as neatly as I can. A little more spare track link seems like a good idea, so I add some to the rear of the hull here, like so. And then I add these inner parts of the mud guards. This was quite fiddly, and I had to do a lot more prodding and nudging than the video would seem to imply, but I don't think it would have been very interesting to show all of that. Then we have another plate that gets mounted to the left side of the engine deck. This was pretty much the same as installing the one on the right side. A little fiddly, but not really an issue. Then I finally install that spare wheel holder in its place on the left side of the hull. I think it would be pretty silly to leave this off. It's a good looking part. Then just in front of that goes a thing. This is probably a jacking block. Not much to say about it really. Onto the rear left plate I glue this gun cleaning set. This easily slots into the holes intended for it. Next I take the two halves of the muffler and glue them together. Like pretty much all of the other parts, this goes together easily enough, though you might need to apply some pressure to get a good fit. 
I like that the hole in the end of the pipe is an actual hole. It makes it look quite a bit better than just painting the end black, or something like that. Same as with the ends of gun barrels, really. That assembly can then be glued onto the rear of the hull. Very exhausty. Towing cables are a sensible thing for a tank to carry, so why not glue that on too? Now when Hans gets this tank bogged, maybe it can be pulled out of the mud. By Hans. I hope he's strong. Then on the right side of the hull, this thing goes. I'm pretty sure this is part of the exhaust system, and it is pretty simple to get into place. It looks decent, but it will largely be hidden by shirts in any way, which I put together next. I glue the support bracket to the top of the shirts and plates. Now would be the time to cut off or otherwise damage any of the plates that you want to be missing, or damaged. I've left mine perfectly intact, because of reasons. We're going to need something to mount these two, so I attach a series of bracket parts. Some of these are easier to get into place than others, but none of them are excessively tricky. At least if you're being careful and trying to get the parts on straight. I'm using the shirts and plates as a rough guide, but I'm sure there's still going to be a bit of misalignment and annoyance when I try to glue them on. But that is for future Herbert to worry about. I'm going to leave these off until at least the base coats are on, just to make the painting a little bit easier. I have temporarily attached the shirts into the hull, and as you can probably tell, the Panzer IV in 172nd scale by Zvezda is completed. I'm fairly happy with how this has turned out. Obviously there are a couple of flaws, the main one, in my opinion, is the fact that the idler wheels and thus the tracks are a bit wonky. They do still look pretty nice though, detail-wise at least. It's likely entirely my fault, I could probably have been a bit more gentle with them, but what's done is done and as long as you look at the tank from the sides it's not too noticeable. Probably would have ended up worse if these were rubber band tracks. Those do tend to apply a bit more pressure to the running gear, and when the running gear isn't especially strong, it does tend to bend and break. Oh well, despite those tracks I'm still pretty happy with it. This was my first Zvezda kit in this scale. I have since built more, like the T-35 I mentioned earlier, the video for which went up a couple of weeks ago. I clearly don't make videos in the order I build things in. I feel comfortable saying that I like Zvezda's models, as a blanket statement. I obviously haven't built all of them, and I understand that some of the old ones are a bit on the lower quality side, but from what I've built, they're pretty good, and the prices are very reasonable, which I'm sure a lot of people appreciate. Sure they're not going to fill the needs of somebody who wants super fine perfectly detailed models, but I don't think they're trying to pass themselves off that way either. For its size and the price point I think the detailing is fairly good. This Panzer IV was a pretty enjoyable build. Though it has been quite some time since I did build it, I do remember enjoying it for the most part, and I think it would make a nice little project for modelers of pretty much any skill level. As usual I did build this model on stream, and if you want to watch me build stuff live, there's a link to my Twitch channel in the description. I would love it if you'd drop by and say hi. I do have plans to build more Zvezda kits in the near future. Not all tanks either. Okay, so what do you think of this Panzer IV? Have you built this kit yourself? Do Panzer IVs make you snore? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And of course if you haven't already, why not subscribe, follow, ring the bell, become a patron or YouTube member, and all of the things you do on YouTube and social media. Links to all of my things are in the description below. And as always, I shall return soon, so until then, be excellent to each other, and thank you for watching. Farewell.